Welcome to Daybreak Australia. I'm Heidi Stroud-Watts in Sydney. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. I'm Annabelle Drawless in Hong Kong and the top story is this hour. Asian stocks prime for gains after an upbeat day on Wall Street, with jobs data supporting the case for Fed rate cuts this year. Around 600 Japanese companies as well report earnings later today. President Xi pledging fresh investment in Hungary as he wins backing from an EU member for Beijing's pushback against overcapacity claims. And we're live to the Bloomberg Tech Summit as Silicon Valley leaders talk AI and much more. We'll hear this out from Snap CEO Evan Spiegel. And kicking off with a little bit of breaking news this morning, we've got Peru's central bank making its rate decision as forecast by most economists. Uh, we are seeing that cut coming through to 5.75% earlier at 6%. At we did actually have a decline last month in consumer prices, so that sort of green lit what has been a second quarter point reduction here. But annual inflation last month slowing to 2.42% in line with the central bank's targets. And they're saying actually toward the end of the year it's going to rise or climb down to around 2%. Uh, of course, Peru, not the only central bank in the region. We actually had Banks Banksico as well. The Mexican central bank, though, had elected to keep its key rate at 11% just in the last couple of hours, Heidi. Uh, and, Belle, of course, oh, we're watching uh, what uh, looks to be a very busy Friday session here in Asia, right? You mentioned the earnings story when it comes to Japan. That will be front and centre when Tokyo comes online. Uh, here in Sydney, we're seeing futures up by about three-tenths of one percent. We're really primed for some pretty robust gains in this Friday session. It was an update date on Wall Street, the jobs data that kind of supported that comfortable case for Fed rate cuts this year. So we are seeing broadly really equity futures across the region uh, climbing in this early part of the morning. In Australia in particular, we did, of course, see uh, that rally across the last few sessions stall in the previous uh, day. We had a five-day run of gains and retailers saw particular weakness. I'll be watching for that in particular uh, in this uh, Friday session as well. But we could see about a pop of about three-tenths of 1% for Australia. And, of course, Bell, as you mentioned, Japan is really one to watch with huge news flow uh, from the earnings uh, calendar today. Yeah, that's right. And also the ones that have been reporting across the course of this week. So lots of different Japanese numbers coming through. But in the U.S., the session dynamics were a little bit different in the session. We actually saw equities continuing to climb. Futures today, again, pointing to some smaller upside as well. But it has been that level of positivity that's come back through, really reinforced by these bets that the Fed is going to have the room to cut rates later this year. And actually, we had those higher than estimated jobless claims as well, really backing that 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 idea among investors. So we've got the S&P 500 now within 1% from its all-time high. Uh, but a survey as well from 22V Research saying that for the next 10% move, basically traders are split at this point. Around 52% are saying it's going to go high. 48% though, Heidi, seeing a down move. <laughs> uh, let's get some views from our next guest, Bill. Uh, still favouring big growth companies in the US. Daniel Yu is head of global asset allocation at Yuenta Securities Career and joins us now from Seoul. Uh, Daniel, really great to have you with us. So when you take a look at kind of the settling of market expectations, uh, the data so far and the communication we've had from major central banks, in particular the Fed, do you think we're seeing valuations where they should be? And do you still see that opportunity across rate sensitive uh, you know, mega cap stocks? Yes. Um, if we look at the overall market, uh, we believe that the if the expected rates are going down in the future, uh, there's quite a bit of upside left for the major big tech as well as the U.S. S&P 500. And also that affects the most of the Asian countries, particularly tech-heavy uh, Kospi as well as the uh, Taiwan uh, index. Uh, if you look at the uh, Nasdaq 100, uh, you are seeing a two-digit growth in earnings, and also S&P 500 is expected to show about 10% uh, growth in earnings. And uh, if you apply about 4.5% interest rate, we think that fair value of S&P 500 is around uh, 5,400. Uh, if that rate is expected to go down to as low as 4% by end of the year, uh, we think that the S&P 500 can rise uh, well above to 5,700 territories. And that would have a positive implication for a lot of the uh, countries in Asia. 
Uh, also, if that happens, we think that the uh, U.S. currency should stabilize as well, uh, and that would have a positive implication for the uh, Korean won appreciation uh, as well as the stabilization of the Asian currencies. So, uh, yes, uh, we think that uh, the rate will have a positive implication. Uh, if the rate goes down, then the implication for the indexes has further upside in the future. You see further upside for Japan as well, but it's interesting. You're perhaps even more constructive on some of the other tech-heavy names or tech-heavy markets in Asia, the mm. likes of Taiwan, Korea, and Vietnam. Yes, uh, I think that we've got to think about what's happening in terms of the overall market. Uh, we are seeing uh, quite of uh, uh, the improvement in the productivity ratios in the U.S. Uh, because of the AI cycle. Uh, a lot of people are worried that in the first quarter, we saw some possible uh, stagflation where the U.S. GDP growth rates going down versus the inflation pressures coming in. Uh, I think that a lot of people are concerned about that affecting negatively for the, a lot of the Asian countries as well. But uh, we think that the, uh, that uh, implication is actually a very short-term uh, affected. It's a seasonal effect rather than a structural issues. If the productivity improvement is happening in the U.S., we think that the inflation pressure should come down uh, and that will have a continuation of growth in the AI sector. Uh, a lot of the uh, countries, particularly Korea and Taiwan, as well as Vietnam, has quite significant uh, market, uh, I guess, the market share in terms of the uh, chip businesses as well as the IT businesses uh, globally. So therefore, they'll have positive, positive implication as the U.S. productivity ratio goes up in the future. Have you been concerned by, by some of the companies that have underwhelmed this earnings season in the chip sector? I'm thinking about AMD, for instance, or, or Supermicro. Uh, yes. Uh, when you look at the uh, overall AI business, uh, as you know, uh, we are seeing quite significant improvement in terms of the sales uh, about the data centers. But we don't think that there's a, a heavy investment happening uh, all around all the IT segment. Uh, we see that a heavy uh, hardware investment is happening, uh, but as far as the software, uh, it's very difficult to uh, figure it out. Uh, so. Uh, we think that the, uh, the, the companies with a very strong market share will continue to show a significant improvement in terms of the earnings as well as sales growth rate. Uh, as far as the other uh, companies, like as you mentioned, AMDs, uh, they might have a somewhat of a, uh, I guess, too much expectation already priced in, so therefore the price improvement might be uh, lagging. Uh, but overall, we think that NVIDIA as well as most of these uh, major hardware uh, companies uh, would have a very strong earnings growth rate, and uh, I think that the share price will, should move accordingly. Uh, some people might be saying that a lot of these companies are already highly overpriced, but we think that if we look at the earnings as well as the uh, potential growth in the AI segment, we think that it's not necessarily that expensive. What about China stocks as well? Because we're seeing a lot more investors turning positive on this group, but are you in that camp, or are you a little bit more cautious still? Uh, well, I think that uh, we can say in the short term, uh, we are quite positive. Because uh, if you look at Chinese government, they have some bullets to spend, uh, to use. Uh, as you know, they are cutting interest rate as well as providing liquidity. Uh, and also, so they're supporting a property market. So in the short term, we think that lower interest rate environment and with the currency depreciating and affecting positively on export side, uh, we think that there is some more positive news uh, happening in, in uh, Chinese stocks. However, in terms of a long run, uh, we think that their competitiveness is not necessarily rising necessarily, uh, other than some of the major sector like uh, EV segment and the uh, renewable energies. Uh, if you look at the IT segment side, yet they are improving in terms of the competitiveness. But nevertheless, we think that the, uh, their uh, competitiveness is not as high as most of the other countries that you compare it with. So therefore, in a long run, it might be not necessarily a positive environment to invest. But as I said, in the short term, a huge liquidity injection is always positive. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, interest rate sensitive stocks uh, and liquidity sensitive stocks of China might show some positive rise over the next maybe several months per se. 
Daniel Yu, Head of Global Asset Allocation at Yuanta Securities Korea. Really great to have you with us. We've got some breaking news on the back of those OCBC numbers. Uh, the offer that they've made to Great Eastern, we are seeing the announcement that they've announced a $1.4 billion Sing voluntary unconditional general offer for the 11.56% stake in Great Eastern, according to a filing with the SGX. They intend to increase the investment in Great Eastern from the current stake of 88.44% with a view to delisting the insurer uh, from the SGX ST. So we are seeing that uh, they're commenting that the capital position will remain strong even after this Great Eastern offer, uh, that they do intend to use internal cash to fund that offer. They expect that this will be earnings adding to OCBC with a view to delist after that. They're basically increasing uh, their 11.56 stake that it does not already currently own in Great Eastern Holdings. They're talking about the capital on the vast opportunities in one of the world's fastest growing regions there. That offer price of $25.60 Sing represents a, almost a 37% premium over the last traded price. We did really see a Bloomberg Intelligence expecting that the capital strength for OCBC could ignite more M&A and more deals. We're seeing that, that bigger core tier one buffer than peers that it has, uh, meaning potentially that OCBC has the further room to expand via M&A and other deals after it did, of course, purchase CBA's Indonesian unit. So we did earlier, uh, if you missed that, get those numbers from Overseas Chinese Banking Corp. The first quarter profit rose, revenue from lending gained, wealth and trading fees surged as well. Um, it was, again, one of these Singaporean and uh, regional lenders that uh, reported profits that beat estimates. You can get that story and the roundup of some of the other stories you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Terminal subscribers can find that at Daybreak Go. It's also on the mobile in the Bloomberg Anywhere app. You can customise those settings as well so you just get the news on the industries and assets that you care about. This is Bloomberg. You're watching Daybreak Australia taking you to some live pictures here. This is the Snap CEO speaking at our Bloomberg Technology Summit for this year in San Francisco. Uh, someone who's reshaped Snap over the last couple of years, but here speaking about a possible TikTok ban in the US. It's a challenging situation for, for our team uh, and, and for our business. Then sort of fast forward into, you know, I think we, we uh, back in 2022 or whatever it was, kind of raised our hands. We're like, hey, we're a little worried. I think real rates are like negative 7%. I remember when you did that and everyone went crazy. <laughs> Things might have to change. Um, and so, we, you know, we were really concerned about the, the macroeconomic environment. And sure enough, rates went up and that really impacted, you know, the high growth tech sector. So there have been a lot of ups and downs. I think the, the important thing for us is just to, to try to adapt to those uh, changes, to try to communicate as openly as possible with our team, with our partners. Um, you know, and, and just uh, work through it. But it's definitely been a, a learning experience. And with a lot of those downs, you guys, downs for the industry, you guys have been a real early mover. You scaled back on headcount before the rest of the social media industry and really the tech industry at large did. You guys refocused and retrenched on new revenue opportunities. You've kind of been the contraindicator um, that's led the pack. Like, when you're in the trenches making those kind of decisions, what did that feel like over the last two years, 18 months? And kind of what were you relying on? Because, you know, nobody could point, you weren't pointing to anyone else saying they're doing it. We have the air cover to do it too. I think for us, it's, it's sort of that combination about being really optimistic about our business and our ability to execute, but really realistic about the environment that we're operating in. And so I, I think as we've seen some of these changes, you know, whether it was the disruption with the you know, ad platform policy changes or the macro economy or the you know, challenges we faced, uh, obviously, with these ongoing uh, wars, we just try to be brutally realistic about the operating environment, but then really have faith in our team and our ability to execute through it that you know, allows us to keep that positivity that I think is so critical in such a you know volatile uh, period of time. So, you know, I think in that way, as leaders, our job is to absorb that sort of external stress, but see it very clearly and chart a path through it with the team. To throw it forward a second, you know, we're sitting at this moment where folks are looking at AI. Everyone's talking about AI, including in this room. How are you thinking about the balance in continuing to grow your ad business, which you've just basically transformed to a certain extent over the last 18 months? and invest in AI, and maybe there are some other executive teams who are perking their ears up listening to you guys. <laughs> like, how are you sitting here thinking about where the investments go on AR, AI versus the rest of the business? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, so first of all, I think all the excitement around AI is is warranted. Uh, so it's real, not hype. It, it's real, uh, and and I think <clears throat> one of the interesting things though about technology is that very oftentimes, you know, the rate of growth of technology is not actually due to the technology itself. It's actually due to the way that humans adopt it. Right, and so very oftentimes, like we're paying attention to the ways that humans are adopting the technology rather than the rate of the evolution of the technology itself, because that really dictates, you know, how society will be transformed, how folks will adopt and utilize this technology in all their businesses, and of course, uh, in, in uh, Snap as well. So we've long used AI, you know, in our recommendation systems and things like that. But what's been very exciting is the way we've been able to apply AI to, you know, image and video and 3D, which are all real core strengths for us, uh, you know, as we open into the camera and into AR experiences. And so we're really excited about, you know, the way that you can transform images uh, with AI, the way that, you know, we graphic artists, 3D artists, you know, would have spent weeks developing some of the models they use in, in uh, AR lenses, now can generate those on the fly uh, using AI. And so I think just the explosion in creativity we're seeing you know, through the adoption of these tools is, is super exciting. And, and the reason why we're at an inflection point is not necessarily just the technology, it's the way that humans are adopting it uh, you know, in their day-to-day -day lives. I still remember when Mark Zuckerberg tried to buy you and you said, absolutely not. And uh, that's the Snap CEO you. there, Evan Spiegel, um, speaking at our Bloomberg Technology Summit in San Francisco about AI, the, the applications, of course, for everyday users, speaking as well about the interest rate environment and as well possible TikTok ban in the US. But we're going to leave that there for now. Uh, Bloomberg subscribers can continue watching a live go. You can also find big, well, the big diary entries coming up today and later this week, as well as some of the events you may have missed earlier. Uh, T Live blog as well underway. But let's shift now to China because President Xi Jinping has secured the Hungarian Prime Minister's support for his pushback against US and EU claims of Chinese overcapacity. For more, let's bring in our Chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel. And Steve, Hungary has always or traditionally had quite a fractious relationship with others in the EU. Right. So, how important is this securing? for China's ambitions in the well, region. Absolutely. It comes at a time of rising uh, trade friction, if you will, with Brussels. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the EC president, has been very outspoken against Chinese overcapacity issues and the potential uh, dumping of EVs and other green products in the European market. Uh, and again, there's this investigation into uh, potential dumping and, and subsidies by the Chinese government and, and the like. And there could be, and, and the Chinese EV makers that I've talked to say they fully expect some sort of tariff regime on EVs. Now, Xi Jinping obviously sees a great opportunity with a country like Hungary, which already has a EV battery supply chain. The, the, the South Koreans are in there. Mm -hmm. The Chinese are in there, CATL. They're building this supply chain into southern Europe, uh, excuse me, southern Germany, where there's automobile factories uh, in Slovakia as well. Look, Hungary has cheaper labor. They have a 9% corporate tax rate. Uh, they are friendly to Chinese investment, extremely friendly. Viktor Orban, the prime minister, uh, basically in lockstep with the Chinese development model, using lower wages in, in his country, uh, wide open land to build these factories, and they are courting that. And that's why Xi Jinping is wrapping up his European trip the first time in five years in two friendly countries to China. That is uh, uh, Slo um, Ser Serbia. Serbia, thank you. And then also now um, Hungary. So it, it, look at the, I'm just going to bring up the statements uh, from Xi Jinping. He says, we will strengthen cooperation in our development strategies, deepening ties in trade, finance, and our economies. He also wrote, by the way, in a ruling party Hungarian newspaper, on the path of Chinese-style modernization and development, we see Hungary as a traveling companion. Now, I want to change the page because we didn't get the actual readout from the Hungarian government of Viktor Orban's statements, but this is from the Chinese readout of his meeting with Xi. It reads like it was written by Beijing, okay? Hungary does not identify with the rhetoric of so-called overcapacity or de-risking. Hungary's determination to deepen cooperation with China is unswerving. 
and will not be interfered by any force. They really do. Beijing does need to get a new English thesaurus because unswerving is definitely a word that the Beijing authorities <laughs> use quite a bit. So I'm not so sure that Viktor Orban used that word. But again, we have to attribute it to the Chinese readout of Viktor Orban's comments towards Xi Jinping. Uh, it's sort of Chinese diplomatic speak bingo, right? Such a fun game. <laughs> um, which companies do you are poised to benefit the most here? Obviously, in Xi Jinping's new three, the big, uh, you know, green story, if you will, the electric vehicles, as well as batteries, solar and the like. Uh, already we're seeing Viktor Orban's government trying to create uh, the infrastructure for uh, the EV industry in the European bloc, uh, the EU trading bloc. Uh, by courting the likes of BYD. They're building a massive plant in uh, Hungary. Also, we're expecting some sort of uh, announcement with Great Wall Motor. We got a statement yesterday saying that NEO has been in talks uh, as well with the Hungarian government. CATL has their facilities and building out even further in eastern Hungary. But also the South Korean big battery makers have already been in Hungary. They're supplying again, as I said, to the German automakers in Bavaria and southern uh, Germany also uh, in Slovakia, I believe it is. So again, in the new three that Xi Jinping has been pushing for technology, green technology are going to benefit. And Viktor Orban is in lockstep with Xi Jinping on that development model. Our Chief North Asia correspondent Stephen Angle there. Uh, one of the other stories that we're following across geopolitics and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has struck a defiant tone against President Biden after the US withheld a shipment of bombs as a warning against invading the southern Gaza city of Rafah. In a post on X, Netanyahu said Israel could stand alone in its war in, on Hamas. But in a later clip for an interview with a US talk show host known as Dr. Phil, Netanyahu said he hoped Israel and the US can find a way to repair pair ties. More to come here on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. Taking you back to our BTEC summit in San Francisco where we're hearing right now from the SNAP CEO Evan Spiegel though is trying to build tools that do help facilitate that connection and bringing people together, especially at a time when we know that real world interaction and communication is vitally important. So mm -hmm. even though, you know, the map sometimes may make you feel like, oh, you know, I wasn't invited uh, to lunch, we hear from people all the time that they're able to actually connect with friends they haven't seen in a while. Even sometimes like, hey, I was, in, I'm, I was at the airport and I didn't realize a friend I hadn't seen since high school was there. And so I just sent him a message and we met up and it was such a special moment. I wouldn't have been able to do that without the map. So I think, you know, trying to facilitate those real world relationships is important and understanding that on balance, sometimes that means that people do feel left out is something that we need to be aware of and also, you know, do our best to, to mitigate when possible. We talked about teens and young people. You guys are really strong there. 87%, I think, of, of, user, of people under the age of 25 in developed countries are on SNAP. Is that still the right? What's the right one? I think it's like more than 75% of their people. Leaving that there, but to remind we do have a Tea Life blog now. that's underway where you can get more from our Bloomberg Technology Summit underway in San Francisco. Aussie dollar balls are in a sweet spot with UBS recommending buying the currency over the euro and the Swiss franc. Bank of America, meanwhile, says an expected rebound in China's economy is another reason to buy. Let's bring Garfield Reynolds, who leaves our markets live Asia coverage. And Garf, are you, are you sort of convinced that this convergence of all the positive factors is going to play out for the Aussie? Well, on the next like one to two months, it's n not too hard to see some strong Aussie dollar gains against everything, you know, but the, the US mm. dollar. Uh, the, we're, we're kind of in a position where the, the main risk would be if we get bad jobs numbers out of Australia, that would obviously you know, unhinge the, the latest tack from the market and from the central bank, which is towards the idea that the RBA is not going to cut rates this year and that in fact there is still a risk of a hike. Uh, 
it's been very interesting to see the way things have evolved so that although the Statistics Bureau brought in some time back a monthly CPI report indicator that's proved to be a fairly unreliable guide uh, to some extent and what matters even more than ever before just about is the quarterly CPI print. So we don't get another one of those until July. So unless you get a severe breakdown in other indicators, then the RBA looks like being the most hawkish of the major central banks at the moment in its stance in that it is definitively on hold for the rest of the year, uh, absent that downturn in inflation. And you would, you would argue that you would need to get both poor jobs data and uh, a severe slowdown in inflation in that 2Q CPI in order for the RBA to say, OK, we're going to put a rate cut back on the table for 2024. Gartha, we've actually just got some breaking news right now. Uh, JP Morgan, we understand, or they announced last year that they were going to be adding Indian government debt to their benchmark EM index starting in June. So that's obviously a milestone for what's Asia's third largest economy. But we're just actually getting some more details on this in particular here because what we're hearing from JP Morgan is that they're saying that that inclusion is on track and also most of their clients are ready for this. So they're expecting somewhere around the vicinity of 20 to $25 billion of foreign inflows. Uh, that assumes an index neutral position. So uh, Garfield, this whole inclusion story, I mean, there's, there's the potential benefits in the sense that uh, you could see perhaps structurally lower interest rates. It could provide some relief for the rupee. But you've also got concerns that perhaps this could increase volatility in the markets there as well. So net net, is this good or is it bad news, do you think? Well, overall, Annabelle, I think it's good news for Indian markets in, in general. Um, it ha provided we can get over the hump of uh, you know, the ongoing Indian election, which has been causing some concerns, especially in the equities market. But even with bonds, um, on the back of the initial uh, you know, decisions by JP Morgan that it was going to be included, uh, you know, this is confirmation of that and of the timing. There was a, a fair bit of inflow that came for in, you know, to Indian bonds as a result, but that had slowed right down uh, in recent weeks, even you know, running into the election. And it was fairly obvious that, along with the general risks that there were around that around that time, uh, you know, when we we had this high US CPI and the uh, potential idea that the Fed might actually hike rates, that meant it wasn't a good time for the bond market in general. Indian bonds definitely you know, went off a little bit at that time and foreign inflows you know, pretty much stopped. So there's that looming appetite there, I think, in general for Indian bonds, given what's been going on, provided you know, the election doesn't spring any nasty surprises. So that's there, and then you have this. So it is a signal that the medium to long-term outlook for Indian bonds and, and possibly to some extent for the rupee is more bullish than it was, and in particular quite bullish for, for bonds. Uh, there are those tactical factors that I mentioned, you know, including if we were, we've got US CPI again next week, if that was to come out uh, robust enough to drive fresh declines in treasuries, that would also you know, have an impact on the bull case for Indian bonds. We're also watching the yuan and there's some questions about the adequacy of China's reserves and therefore its ability to be able to defend any further slumps in the currency. Is this sort of building a bear case? I think it underscores that you can never be too sure that the you know that that the bear case has gone away. Yeah. Um, I mean, one, I am a little bit cautious because you know, the metric cited uh, is is you know, based on developed markets with an open capital account that doesn't describe China on, on either of those values. So the the line from this being low to this being a problem 
is, is a little bit more conflicted, it's not so straightforward. But there is a strong overall bear case on the yuan. Uh, the PBOC has had a lot of success when it stepped in. It's been helped by the fact that the Japanese have managed to at least cap declines in the yen. So all of that has been, you know, helpful. But it you know, this metric underscores that there may be limits to what the PBOC does. And the big risk for the yuan in particular and Chinese markets in general that's going to grow over the coming six months is the US presidential election is coming. And that is going to highlight you know, the potential from either side of politics for fresh tariffs, for fresh confrontation with China. We've got the TikTok case going. All of that indicates that we can get plenty of volatility and that it's going to be hard for the authorities to do much more than slow the yuan's decline. I mean, for that matter, slowing the decline is all they want to do, which, again, is one of the reasons why the metric is it's, uh, you know, it's an ominous backdrop without being a game changer because the game at the moment for the PBOC is slow the declines. China's economy is recovering, but it's still weak. They're looking to ease policy. So all of that says the yuan's on the back foot. The main thing is the PBOC wants to make sure it doesn't actually tumble backwards. That was Garfield Reynolds there who leads our Markets Live Asia coverage. And from the PBOC to the Bank of England, because we heard from Governor Andrew Bailey, who says there would be a case for cutting rates in the UK if the economy and inflation play out as expected. He spoke to us after the Monetary Policy Committee voted 7-2 to two to hold rates steady. Our forecasts are conditional on a number of things, but one of the things that obviously I are conditional on is we use the market curve to set them up. So I think it's important that if we, you know, if we find that a forecast with the market curve produces a best judgment, which has inflation below target or above target, wherever, but not at target at the, at the sort of horizon, we, we say so. We say this is where we got to. Best collective judgment is that. Now, it follows, I think, that, and this is the comment I made earlier, that it, what we're saying is if, and the if is, of course, critical here, if the world evolves as you know, that, that forecast suggests it was, well, probably the case would be there for a less restrictive path of policy. So is it's June, all conditional. Everything is conditional. Is June a live meeting? All meetings are live. So is, is June likely? Ah, that's a different question. <laughs> That's different. Look, I, th I think the key points I would make is that we have changed our view on the likely persistence of, of inflation, on the second round effects. And I think it's good news. We think that we think there's, an, there's evidence there to suggest they will be less pronounced than we thought they would be. But that's a judgment. And we, you know, for me, I'm now looking at you know, particularly these three key indicators, services, inflation, pay and the quantity side of the labour market to really judge this persistence question, how it will evolve. Governor, th there is an assumption looking at history that once you cut, you continue cutting. Now, without prejudging what you'll do, can you give us an idea of how you see the cycle different to... Well, to one own? thing I would say about this, which is sort of quite interesting, and it's something that we looked at during this round, it's quite interesting in the history of the MPC that most of the cutting cycles, cycles in inverted commas, have actually been prompted by some sort of shock or other, rather than being what I might call a natural cyclical sort of, we've reached the top and now we go down the restrictiveness curve. So we don't have a lot of, I mean, I would just caution, there isn't a lot of sort of history really to... So, so what you're telling like. us is because you're, you're not cutting in a recession, it could, it could actually be one and done? Well, I, I think that would be unusual. Um, but I, I would say, you know, as I said earlier, nothing's settled, nothing, there are no fetter companies, nothing's ruled out. Um, Governor, what can you tell us about the, the, the play between, of course, interest rates and QT, right? Some may find a confusion because they're, they're pulling in different directions. So the, the message we've always given with QT is that QT operates in the background for us. We don't think it has large impacts uh, in terms of markets. But the other point, and this is really the critical point, when we sit down to decide on what the right interest rate setting is, we take into consideration everything, including markets, 
obviously, and markets will have absorbed, if you like, and taken into account the impact of QT. So, in other words, QT is, is always there, if you like. If there is any effect from QT, we'll capture it because we'll capture it in the movement of markets and then we will set bank rates to reflect that. But you don't think it's confusing for markets, this kind of pull? I don't pull think and... so, no. I don't think so. So you're not, you're not expecting it to end it before the end of the year to make sure that there's no confusion in what you're trying oh, to do with the economy? I don't think there was, to my mind, any difficulty if we get to the point when we're going to cut interest rates to have QT going on as well. BOE Governor Andrew Bailey there with Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix. You can watch us live and catch up on our past interviews in our interactive TV function. That's at TV Go. You can also dive into any of the securities or the Bloomberg functions we talk about. You can join in on the conversation too by sending us instant messages during our shows. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Do check it out. It's at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. The ARM CEO is downplaying concerns over an AI spending slowdown that was fueled by his company's lukewarm revenue forecast for the fiscal year. Rene Haas told us why he's still confident in the chip designer's long-term growth. We're actually forecasting even higher growth this year, uh, north of 20 percent. And uh, we also signaled to the markets yesterday that in uh, 25, 26, 27, we see that growth uh, continuing. So we have incredible visibility uh, to our business. And we're very, very confident of this growth rate going forward. I want to focus in on the cell phone play, Renee, because that's been where your bread and butter has been in history. How are we looking from a smartphone perspective? Is the market looking strong to you? We've had many a mixed message coming from China demand, for example. Overall, what we've seen in the smartphone market, particularly for ARM, has been uh, quite a good growth rate in terms of royalties. Our version 9, which is now being used in uh, many of the premium uh, mobile phones, uh, that drives a higher royalty rate for ARM. Uh, there's also more complex CPUs that go into that. That's also better for ARM. And going forward, Caroline, one of the things that we're seeing, and it's not just in smartphones, is that as these AI models are moving so fast, the hardware can't keep up with the software. Uh, the software innovation is happening so quickly mm. that uh, by the time the hardware is ready to run those models, everyone wishes they had, a, they had more performance, they had more efficiency. So what does that mean for ARM? It's driving growth in our licensing activity. Uh, people are looking to do more and more uh, design chips faster and faster, and that's all, all good for us going forward. So I think going forward, you're going to see more and more innovation happening, not only in the smartphones, but across all these edge devices. Rene, what's been keeping up is your valuation. Boy, I mean, do you think there's too much exuberance around AI valuations out there? Are you going to make the most of it by, well, we talked to one point of listing in the UK too. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think about the valuations as much as I just think about the AI opportunity, which I uh, frankly believe is is undercalled in terms of just what it's going to mean uh, relative to society and what it can do for our planet. Uh, I think, again, we are in very, very early days in terms of the capabilities of what this can unleash for our society. Uh, incredibly excited to be part of it, uh, but I don't think we're part of a, a hype cycle at all. I think there's a lot of innovation taking place. and. You know, frankly, the, the innovation that's taking place and the inventions that we're seeing, it's just breathtaking. So, no, I, I don't personally view it as a hype cycle at all. That was the ARM CEO, Rene Haas, speaking with Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde after ARM's earnings underwhelmed investors early this week. But sticking with that earnings theme, because Nissan is forecasting a stronger than expected operating profit on cost cuts and a weak yen. The Japanese automaker also sees robust sales in the US and China as it rolls out new models. Our auto and aviation reporter, Supriya Singh, joins us from Tokyo. And uh, Supriya, what sort of market reaction do you think we should be expecting then at the open? Uh, hi. So Nissan has projected uh, an operating profit of 600 billion yen, which is around $4 billion. As you said, it, it will be uh, coming from their strong uh, sales in Japan and ASEAN and the new models that they plan to roll out in, in the U.S. and China. Uh, Nissan will also benefit around 70 billion yen from the weak yen. Uh, because yen has uh, accelerated, weakened a lot in the last one or two years. 
uh, when the market opens, we will see because uh, Nissan has actually cut uh, revised down its forecast uh, last year. So market reaction will be really something that we need to look how market really reacts to it. If they really believe that Nissan can fulfill it because they have also uh, announced they plan to have additional 1 million of annual sales within three years. So today's market reaction will really show that if Nissan, uh, if, if, if market players really believe that Nissan can achieve its, its goal. So that's really something uh, I, I really can't talk about, but something we need to watch out for. But as for the weekend, uh, J Japanese automakers have been benefiting from a weekend so far. And Nissan has also, as I said, uh, set a 70 billion of uh, yen of profit from a weekend. But uh, Nissan CEO Makoto Uchida has expressed concerns that uh, volatility, volatility in the weekend is, uh, actually affects um, their business uh, planning and strategy making. So they really wish to see uh, a stable yen, uh, although a weekend uh, so far has been benefiting them. And they have projected uh, forex rate at 145 so far for this year. Ex and uh, Honda and Mazda expected later. Expectations are pretty high for Honda. Mazda is disappointed yes. on guidance. Uh, as for Honda, they, we are also expecting to see a bright outlook for Honda, uh, around $9 billion operating profit. Uh, or market uh, market ex is expecting Honda to release today uh, because they, they sold a good number of cars in the U.S. Uh, last year. And as we see that hybrids are again becoming popular and uh, hybrids demand in the U.S. Is, continue, uh, is, is, is expected to continue this year as and EV's demand is expected to lower down. So we are expecting a strong uh, uh, outlook from Honda as well. And um, Honda has also launched new series in China this year during the Beijing Auto Show, which will go on sale from this year. So, and market players will also be watching uh, if, um, any possible comments uh, for from Honda CEO uh, regarding their potential, potential alliance with Nissan, uh, which they announced in March. As, as Japanese automakers are struggling in China, Nissan and Honda uh, are studying if they can really uh, do something about uh, Japanese automakers' uh, slow uh, EV making uh, uh, strategy. Supriya, and that was Supriya Singh, our auto and aviation reporter from Tokyo. And other stories that we're tracking this morning in the auto space, Bloomberg's learned that Geely's high-end electric car brand Zika fetched some $441 million in an expanded U.S. IPO. Sources say the company sold 21 million ADRs for $21 apiece. That marks the biggest U.S. IPO in three years by a Chinese company. Shares are going to start trading in New York on Friday under the symbol ZK. Tesla is cutting more jobs in China amid a slowdown in EV sales and intense competition. Sources tell us that additional layoffs began early this week, affecting departments from production to customer service. The cuts include staff at Tesla's Shanghai plant, home to more than half of the company's global production, Heidi. Uh, and, well, we do have the Japan current account balance data just crossing the Bloomberg. The March trade surplus coming in at 491 billion yen. That is uh, slightly shy of expectations, or well, almost 550 billion yen. The current account surplus coming in at 3.39 trillion yen. The adjusted current account surplus at just over 2 trillion yen for the month of March. Of course, these numbers have come under increasing scrutiny when we did get a Bloomberg analysis looking at the BOJ's account suggestion that Japan did intervene uh, in recent sessions to support the yen. That uh, Bank of Japan account changes suggesting that we saw that $5.5 trillion yen intervention. To that end, we're also hearing... Uh, now from Japanese policymakers, the finance minister Shinichi Suzuki speaking in Tokyo uh, as he tends to at this time of day, uh, really commenting on uh, the wage numbers that we had through yesterday, aiming for wage growth that exceeds inflation, seeing wage growth outpace last year's gains and also commenting uh, a, a little bit when it comes to the FX levels. They've refrained from commenting on what is appropriate when it comes to levels to the yen, but again, reiterating they'll take appropriate measures on FX without hesitation. We do have uh, much more coming up here on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg.
top corporate stories this hour on Bloomberg has learned that Apple plans to push many new AI tools across its devices through data centers using its own chips. Sources say the high-end M2 Ultra chips will be deployed in cloud computing servers designed to process the most complicated of AI tasks. Apple is expected to lay out its ambitious AI strategy in June. Meanwhile, Apple has issued a rare apology over an online ad for its latest iPad Pro. The images of musical instruments, televisions, paint cans and other creative tools being crushed into an iPad sparked a furious online backlash. Among the critics was actor Hugh Grant, who says the ad promotes the, quote, destruction of the human experience. Apple now won't air the promo on television as planned, Bill. Well, Heidi, I'm actually just watching, finishing off that ad right now, and I've got to say it's extremely depressing. <laughs> uh, ad, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, I can understand, actually, the reaction, and I think Hugh Grant encapsulated it fairly well. Yes, there's, there's technology, and we, we love the, what it can do, but you also just can't replace some of those things that you see, things like painting or, or toys or, or that there. I mean, it's, it's extremely depressing to watch. Uh, I was just also tracking well, who made this because that's always the big question. Was it in-house? Was it out of house with an agency? And this one, we we're actually not sure at this point in time. That's a really interesting point because, you know, Bella, as you know, uh, Apple's products have been, you know, so key for creatives, right? And as they say, creativity is in our DNA at Apple. It's important to design products and empower creatives. This was really a, 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 a rare misstep when it comes to uh, the way that messaging came across. So an apology, we won't be seeing it again. Market opens in Sydney, Seoul and Tokyo are next. This is Bloomberg.